tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. Thank you for all your uh, communication and uh, participation in the service tonight. Let's turn our hearts toward the Lord and toward his word. As you know, this chapter can be divided up in the following way. The collection for the saints is verses 1 through 4. The coming of visitors, verses 5 through 12. The commands for the church, verses 13 and 14. And that's where we'll be tonight, the commands for the church. The rest of the chapter goes like this. The commendation of helpers, verses 15 through 18. The closing of the epistle, verses 19 through 24. So let's talk about verses 13 and 14 for a little while tonight, and I'll probably take a little bit of liberty with those verses and share some things that are on my heart. Verses 13 and 14, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, that all things be done with charity. So in this verse, you will notice we have a natural fourfold command for believers. We have the first word, watch. The second command would be stand. The third one would be quit, not like the quit we normally think of. And the fourth one is be strong. So the first word, watch, has the idea of vision and eyes. And I want you to start thinking about the picture that is drawn here. So when you say watch, you're definitely talking about eyes or eyesight. By the way, we ought to pray for Brother Ron and his surgery on Friday, right? So he has another cataract that needs to be removed. So that's going on Friday. And the other one is not doing as well as he's expected it. So how many of you will pray for Brother Ron and another cataract surgery, okay? I meant to mention that earlier and it slipped my mind. But vision is important. How many of you know vision is important? So it says, watch, watch. So that has the idea of vision. It has the idea of our eyes. Then the second word, stand, has the idea of feet and legs. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the weaker my legs get. And that makes a whole lot of difference. I'm glad I still have some strength in my legs but I can tell that that's going away slowly. Aren't you glad you can walk? Yeah, glad you can walk. Then the third word is quit. It has the idea of the spirit. In other words, what's inside the man. And then the fourth word has the meaning that be strong has the idea of muscles or muscular power. So what you're looking at is a picture, even though this, we're not talking about a specific body or person but it has the picture of a strong man's body that's what it has the picture that you're looking at one who is highly discerning one who is highly committed one who is very resolute and one who is courageous and so that is the picture of a believer that is strong in the Lord or we could say mature in the Lord and that is a thought of this passage of scripture. So this strong person, strong man, I believe it's referring to a male on purpose here uh, for the idea of strength and power and so on. But this is no wimpy. This is no fearful. This is no crybaby. This is no double-minded man. This is no defeated man. This is no doubting man. This is a believer that has some very strong uh, characteristics. I would call this man that, has, that we're given a picture of, it's a visual picture, uh, it's not the actual person, we call them straw men sometimes, but this straw man is a strong man like we would consider the fictional character of Superman. Now are you getting the idea of this first? Hopefully that helps you get this first. Watch it. Does Superman have strong vision? Does he? Supposedly. 
Uh, stand fast in the faith. Has he got strong legs? Yes. Does he uh, have a strong spirit? Quit you like men. Is he a man, Superman type? Yes, he is. Is he strong? Oh, yes, he's got kryptonite and all the rest of it. So here we have a picture of a Superman believer. I don't know if you heard this or not. But I was totally surprised, and this is one of my detours, but it has a bearing on this scripture. We're talking about a strong Christian. We're talking about watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a super Christian. But I heard about the new Superman comic book that's coming out shortly in November. Superman's son, Jonathan, is slated to come out as a bisexual. Have you heard that? Son of Cal, E1 number five, written by Tom Taylor with art by John Timms, which will be published on November the 9th, is gonna portray this Jonathan, the son of Superman, as a bisexual. Jonathan and his male friend, Jay, introduced earlier in the series, will share a kiss. Now, that gives you, what that's doing, the reason I brought that up is the world is now giving us their version of a Superman. That's the world's version of a Superman. But is that the Bible version of a super believer? That is not the Bible. By the way, that is absolutely against the Bible. That is absolutely against Christ. Is that right? So this bisexual hero, Jonathan, is against Christ. Is that right? Amen. That's exactly right. So a superhero is supposed to be the ideal the best and the bravest of all. Now the best, biggest, and bravest is now being paraded as a pervert, which makes being a queer a hero. Is that backwards? Is that upside down? Has our society being fed, is our society being fed a bill of goods that is totally against God and the Bible and Jesus Christ? Who's going to read those comic books, young people? Is that right? Are the young people being brainwashed into what a real hero is? Yes, they are. And our verse is talking about a Bible, spiritual, strong man. <clears throat> and here's what the Bible says about those folks who turn that upside down. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's Isaiah 5.20. According to Isaiah 5.20, there is a curse on Tom Taylor, the editor of this comic strip series, and on the artwork by John Timms. You say, preacher, what's going to happen to him? I have no idea what's going to happen to him, and I'm not pronouncing a curse, but the Bible pronounces a curse on those that call evil good. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> there is a woe or curse on these two men. Tom Taylor is an Australian who had been writing comics since the age of 14. One of his popular series in the comic strips world now is Star Wars. And, of course, he didn't write Star Wars. Uh, George Lucas, I believe, did that. But uh, he wrote some comic strips of the Star Wars. And it has that famous phrase throughout it, May the Force be with you. How many of you ever heard that? And do you know that I heard a national commentator on news the other day talking to someone who had lost a loved one or something and said something like this instead of our prayers are with you and may God bless you he said and may the force be with you a commentator is America falling for these false theologies 
False theology is what it is. <clears throat> so what uh, these heroes try to do in the comic strip and in Star Wars is uh, heroes like the Jedi who seek to become one with the Force. Notice that. They seek to become one, uni united or union with the Force, while Sith and the other villains exploit the force and try to bend it toward their will. Now, I want you to notice the theological similarities of that. We as believers, as Christians, are to be one with Christ. Is that true? Amen. In other words, there's a union with the believer in Christ. So in this false theology, that there's that little tiny bit of truth to be one with the force. But we're not talking about a force. We're talking about a person. Notice the force takes away the personality of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. The force is not a person. It's just a force. And that is a definite uh, uh display of antichrist if you please so they not only say that we need to be one with the force but they say also that we try to bend the force and the will of the force to do what we want them to do in other words you can tell the force to do evil or you can tell the force to do bad whatever you want the force to do i got news for you folks i pray to god and i want him to change some things about me and others and situations and circumstances. But in the last resort, I have to say, and every believer has to say, thy will be done. I cannot go against the will of God. Amen? Amen. Almost all other religions, excluding Christianity, view evil and good as two opposing forces. I need to remind us tonight that evil and good are not two opposing forces as they see it. They see evil and good as eternal forces. May I remind you of the doctrine of sin. Sin is not eternal. Amen. You say, how do you know sin is not eternal? Because there was no sin until Adam sinned. Amen. You might say Satan probably first. But there, and, but there was no sin before that. But until Satan fell and Adam and Eve sinned, there was no sin. So sin is not eternal. And there's no doubt about it that sin one day... It was destroyed at Calvary, but one day it will be destroyed forever. So sin is not eternal. It did not have uh, the eternal eternality before the creation, and it will not have eternality after we are in heaven. But all other beliefs, all other beliefs believe that evil is eternal and is a force forever, and that good is a force and it is forever. But I want you to know that is not the truth. How many of you know what a yin-yang is? Anybody know what a yin-yang is? How about a circle with a black and a white little thing on one side, a black thing on one side, and a white thing on the other side? It's a yin-yang. That indicates a symbol of good and evil, eternal forces forever fighting against one another. That's what it's all about. That's what the yin-yang states, basically, with its symbolism. But I want you to know, without a doubt, you as a believer ought to know that evil or sin is not eternal. How many of you know that? Sin is not eternal. Aren't you glad sin's not eternal? Amen. Praise God, it's not eternal. We ought to thank God for that every single day. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Talking about the Lord Jesus. Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and all the enemies of Christ will be put under his feet. They will be destroyed forever. So there's much more to, for me to say on the doctrine of sin. But one thing is certain and different from all other religions that we believe in Christianity, sin is not eternal. It had a beginning and it will have an ending. The great gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ is the remedy for mankind's epidemic 
and a lifelong struggle with sin. But thank God for this. The Alpha and the Omega has taken care of the beginning and the ending of sin. If it were not for what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, there would be a perpetual battle. But thank God, sin cannot be victorious over the believer because of Calvary. Amen. Aren't you glad that Christ died and rose again for us so that sin does not have power? Romans chapter 6. The theology of Star Wars, the movie series by George Lucas, and comics as written by Tom Taylor is a false theology. And I want you to know something. It is a theology. I know a man right now who knows every single episode, has recorded it and saved it and reviews them often on Star Wars. And he, as I witness to him from time to time, try to witness to him from time to time, he just cannot seem to grasp the gospel because he believes in Star Wars. That's his theology. So <clears throat> we would normally say God instead of force, and I hope that's what you do. We Would you believe that a fictional story like Star Wars affects people to having a false faith in a force? Do you think that these young people listening to Star Wars, watching Star Wars, and also playing the games that have to do with that, do you think that they're not being affected by the belief system in that game or in that movie or in that comic book? Young people are being fed a false theology about God. You know what we ought to do? We ought to pray that the gospel truth would get to these young people somehow. Well, how's the gospel, is this false theology getting to them? The gospel is getting to them through written comic books. The gospel of a false theology is getting to, to them through movies. The gospel that is false is getting to them through games. You know, maybe we ought to pray that God would raise up some people that could write good theological comic strips. Maybe we ought to pray that God could give us some people who would produce good Christian, biblical, I mean, giving the gospel out movies. You say, preacher, there's some that do that. Wouldn't you like to see some that don't wishy-washy around and play with theology? Wouldn't you like to see some good, theologically sound movies like Bob Jones has presented for so many years? Shouldn't there be more of that? More Young people are growing up on this stuff. Shouldn't there be some Christian gamers? Somebody that could write a game for Christian young people that's Got the right theology. That'd be made. You say, preacher, that's far-fetched. That's the, that's the wrong mission field. Well, couldn't a person do that and still stay straight and be fundamental and be right? Couldn't somebody do that? You know, instead of people sitting down and playing all these games with false theology, looks like somebody would write one and produce one and put it out. Amen. Oh, uh, yeah. A Amos chapter 5, verse 14 says, Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you. The God of hosts, not the force. The God of hosts shall be with you, as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. We are like the remnant of Israel right now. Our numbers seem to be decreasing as the woke culture pervades every aspect of our society. They are turning right into wrong. They're turning everything upside down. Therefore, they wish to destroy all vestiges of the past, tear down statues, change all laws that punish wrongdoing, label and de denigrate all who oppose them. That's the woke culture in which we're facing right now. The Bible term for that kind of culture is simply this, Antichrist. Antichrist. The Bible says in Daniel 7, 25, talking about the Antichrist, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. 
That's exactly what's going on. The woke culture is trying to change every single law, especially a law that would punish a wrongdoer. So the Antichrist is going to think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand in a time and times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years of the tribulation period. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, this is 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now, this is first century, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. There are Antichrists, there were Antichrists in the first century, and there are Antichrists in this century right now. No doubt about it. The woke culture is an Antichrist culture. Amen. Amen. It's an antichrist culture. This stuff we're reading about, about Tim, uh, Tim Taylor and uh, Tom Taylor, anyway, uh, the fellow that wrote this comic strip, that Tom Taylor, that fellow is antichrist in his writing. Amen. Jo George Lucas, antichrist in his Star Wars writing. Now listen to this. In the best-selling fighting game called Injustice, God's Among Us, gods among us here is the plot listen to the plot of this game very popular I mean made millions very popular game called injustice gods among us here's the plot in a parallel universe the Joker tricks Superman into killing his pregnant wife Lois Lane Lois Lane and detonating a nuclear weapon that destroys Metropolis killing millions of people Mad with grief and rage, Superman murders the Joker, quickly losing his moral compass. Five years later, Superman has formed the One Earth regime to enforce global peace through fear and rules the Earth as a ruthless dictator. Alongside many other heroes and villains, he recruited or forced into joining him and killing any who oppose him. You say, Preacher, what is that referring to? Well, it's supposed to be just a plot of a game. But you know what that sounded like to me? A description of the Antichrist. That's exactly what it sounded. The very plot of that game sounded like a description of the Antichrist. Do you know I'm serious? Our younger generation and generations even before them have been programmed with this theology. How can we expect any different from them? I'll tell you what needs to be done. There needs to be somebody to tell young people about Jesus Christ. Would you not agree? Somehow, some way or another, somebody needs to tell some young people about Jesus. I heard just recently, I heard about a young person just recently who knew absolutely nothing about the Bible. I told you about those kids down there at Cherry Grove South Carolina, who didn't even know the word Bible. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. In the last time, without a doubt, we believers need to heed the command of 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Now let me go through those words again. As we wrap this up, the command about caution is watch ye. Be alert against all evil. Evil is subtle. It has to be watched and guarded against constantly. Failure to watch can result in one being blindsided by evil temptation. Folks, I want you to know something. This watch ye means that we have to be as a superhero in spiritual things we have got to have strong vision, discernment against what is evil. And, Betty, we better watch it carefully. So I encourage all of us to be strong in this matter or have good vision. Watch. Now, there are so many illustrations I could give you of people who did not watch and fail. And, you know, I'm just a little bit tired of hearing about those that fail. I'd like to hear about some who didn't fall. Wouldn't you? There are lots of people who didn't fall. And you never 
hear about them. Those people who didn't fall are called overcomers. And I'd like to hear more illustrations on the overcomers instead of those who fell. The Bible says, I have written unto you, fathers, <clears throat> because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And so this person is called an overcomer. He overcame the wicked one, and the reason that he did, the secret, and that verse is abiding in the word of God. I'm a, I'll tell you one way you can watch. One way you can watch is to be in your Bible and not just read it for duty's sake and not just read it to check off a list but to read it and to get something from it that will help you in your life and then the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4 you're of God little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I'll tell you, you know who's in you. Jesus Christ is in you and the Holy Spirit is in you. And are they stronger than the devil? Are they? Is Jesus Christ stronger than the devil? Is the Holy Spirit stronger than the devil? Are they stronger than all temptations? Absolutely. We seem to forget that we have within us the Holy Spirit of God and he is stronger than every single temptation. And then there's a command about consistency. It says stand fast in the faith. That means to be consistent. So there's a word of caution. There's the command of caution. Then there's a command about consistency. That means stay with it. Do what you're supposed to do. The false teachers uh, in, uh, abounded in... Uh, in uh, Corinth, where this letter is written to those people. And those people in Corinth were having a time. They were all bunched up in little cliques and little groups. And this one was for this one, this one was for that one. Immorality was in the church. Oh, you know the story. You, you've heard me preach it. It was in a terrible shape. And he said, you've got to be consistent now. You've got to stand fast in the faith. Don't be jumping around all over the place, going from this click to this click to that thing to this thing and believe this and not believe this. Don't, don't be that way. I remember Billy Kelly had several sermons that he liked to preach on a regular basis. One of his regular sermons was uh, from Psalms 108, and it begins with this phrase, Oh, God, my heart is fixed. And Billy Kelly would rear back and say that, Oh, God, my heart is fixed. And his big throat would beller out like a bullfrog. I'll tell you something, but he had one thing right. We need to settle some things. We need to be consistent about some things. We don't need to be inconsistent up one day and down the next day. We need to stand fast. We need to watch ye, and we need to stand fast in the faith. That may be consistent, do the same things over and over again. I was speaking to a lady uh, this yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, and about her faith. And she told me that she went to one of these big churches that has the satellite, you know, the preacher's on the screen and he's preaching somewhere else. And uh, she said, I just love it. So they let the kids go somewhere else. And she said, and the preacher's on the screen and uh, he's not in a pulpit anywhere. He's just up on the screen. And he said, but before they have the preaching, they have the singing worship team up there. And she said, I didn't say it. She said, they're jamming it out. And then she began to grin and smile and bit, almost rejoicing like her faith was so bubbly and so joyful, she said, and it's like Led Zeppelin. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, do you understand? She said, no, I don't understand a word they're saying. I said, I don't either. I said, I've tried to listen to some of it. You, you can pick it up on YouTube or somewhere. I said, I've tried to listen. I said, but I can't understand. She said, I don't understand it either. I said, well, how do you know what they're saying? She said, I look it up on my phone, and then I know what they're saying. I think that's ridiculous, don't you? And then I think another thing is ridiculous, that she would uh, equate the worship team with Led Zeppelin. How do you equate Christian music with Led Zeppelin? You say, who is that? I, I really don't know, but I know he's a rock music artist I know that so how, how do you equate the two the only way you can equate Led Zeppelin with Christian quote music is if the music is about the same and the music according to her 
was like Led Zeppelin, rock mu music star. I'm telling you something. Guess what I did? I had to be consistent. You say, preacher, did you get all over? No, I didn't get all over. I just said, I, I'm going to share a verse with you that tells you about music. She said, okay. I'm looking her straight in the eyeballs, and I said, Ephesians 5, 18, 19. And I couldn't quote it just right, but later I pulled it up on the phone, and I, I got, by the way, get the Bible on your phone. I pulled it up on the phone, I showed it to her. Here it is. It says, uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speak it to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. I said, you see that? Sp sing, uh, making melody in your heart and singing, speaking to yourselves in hymns and songs, spiritual songs, making melody. I said, you see that? Yeah. I said, that's your standard for your music. Amen. How many of you know we have a doctrine of music in the Bible? Doctrine of music. And we ought to stay with it. Amen. We ought to be consistent with our doctrine of music. We ought to be consistent with the doctrines that we have and the inspiration of and so on. And Billy Kay would stand up and say, I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. Well, I believe in the doctrine of music too, don't you? Because look what's taking the world by storm. Look what's taking our young people. Rock music. Is that right? Yeah. So I got to hurry on. Be consistent. The command about character. Now, we had the command about caution and the command uh, <clears throat> about consistency. Now we've got the command about character. It said, quit you like men. And I said, preachers, that means just quit. No, it doesn't mean cease from being a man. It means exactly the opposite. It doesn't mean cease from being a man. It means be a man. It means, look, have you ever heard this phrase, man up? Anybody ever heard that phrase, man up? Man up. That means stand up to the plate and swing the bat, man. Don't just back off. Don't be, you know, foolish and careless and, and just walk off and compromising. Take your place. Stand in the gap. Make up the hedge. I mean, be a man. We have that same idea in uh, the story of the Philistines. They gathered together to fight against Israel. And as they fought against Israel, they slaughtered like 4,000 right away. And this is during the days of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. And they slaughtered 4,000. And then the children of Israel said, let's, let's pray. We better pray. And they prayed and said, we need the ark of the Lord. Let's get the ark of the Lord. So they got the ark of the Lord and brought it into the camp of the Israelites. And when they brought the ark of the Lord in there, a great shout went up. I mean, a real shout. And boy, the Philistines said, what in the world is this? What is going on? Then they heard or knew somehow, maybe a spy told them, the ark of God has come to the camp of the Israelites. And so they got afraid and scared. And all the men began to quiver and to shake and almost ready to desert. And the leaders of the Philistines said, quit you like men and fight. That means stand up, be brave. And that's the first mention of that little phrase, quit you like, and here it is repeated in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. Quit you like men. I mean, be strong, be brave, be courageous. Stand in the fight, get there, do it. Stop being scared. Start, stop being a chicken. Fight, don't run, don't give up. Now that's what the idea is for the believer. Don't quit. Stand in there, fight, go for it. Be brave. Quit you like men. And then there's a con the command about consecration. It says be strong. That's consecration. That's referring to spiritual strength. It means you get the word of God regularly. It means you must be consecrated to the Lord. James warns us about being a halfway Christian. He says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Hey, guess what? A halfway Christian is never going to be strong. A double-minded man is like a man standing at the fork in the road and trying to go both ways at the same time. Can you go both ways when you come to a fork in the road? You've got to go one way or the other. Sadly to say, a lot of people choose the easy way out. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The greatest fork in the road for the believer is materialism and God. And we stand at that fork in the road and say, is it God or is it materialism? 
sadly to say, many believers choose materialism. Then there's a command about charity, verse 14. It says, let all things be done with charity in verse 14. Now, I'm going to tell you something. How many of you are ready for a confession? Are you ready for the preacher to confess? Okay, I, I thought some of you just kind of, oh, I'm about, about time you did. Sorry, Rascal, I guess you better. Okay, I'm going to confess anyway. I have tried to do some things without charity, and guess what? It didn't work. And guess what? I have tried to do some things with charity. And guess what? It worked. And I suppose that every single one of us have done the same thing. We try to do some things without charity. It'll never work. And then sometimes we do some things with charity. And it does work. The writer of the Hebrews maybe it was Apollos, warns us about bitterness, which is displayed outwardly by negative comments. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When things are done without charity, it makes bitterness. Bitterness and negativism is like the COVID virus. It spreads profusely. I'll finish with this illustration. It's a short one, but I want you to think about it. A man was walking down the street. He passed a used bookstore. And in the window, he saw a book with the title, How to Hug. And being of somewhat romantic nature, he decided to go into that used bookstore and buy the book. To his chagrin or disappointment, he discovered that the book was the seventh volume of an encyclopedia set that read, How to Hug. Here is the moral to my little story and the one that was told as I read it. Everyone knows that a church is a place where love ought to be manifested. Everyone should know that the believer's life should be a life of the love of God, and that, that love should be manifested in their life. Everybody knows that. But sadly speaking, the church is not that demonstration of love sometimes. And the life of the believer is not that demonstration of love. It is only an encyclopedia of theology. Folks, I don't want my life to be an encyclopedia of theology. I want it to be a demonstration of the love of God. We should do all things with charity. Let's pray.